Okay, that's fine. Okay, um, last time we talked about uh, some um, ORD and semigroup and eek and bounded. And that was pretty, uh, I, didn't, I didn't expound too much on the theory behind it. Um, but then when it comes time for me to try and explain uh, hating algebra, because like how, how many people here like know what, about hating algebra? Because for me, I only know that hating algebra should be called Boolean algebra because I just want to do ands and ors and nots. And hating algebra provides those operations and every other language calls that Boolean. But PeerScript calls it hating algebra. So I really wanted to explain like why hating algebra is a thing in PeerScript. Like why not just, why not just use Boolean algebra? So I, I did like a lot of read, reading on Wikipedia to try and uh, have us understand this. And I am still not a professional in this. I'm, I'm not familiar. So this is just like me uh, reporting on my reading. <laughs> but I think I have it in the relatively organized manner now so I can explain it. Um, so if we look at from just a user's point of view, what hating algebra is, um, it has some rules and then it has the operations that we want uh, to use when we want to do logic stuff. Um, logic being like predicates, like is like this is true, that is false. Um, and in every other language you use the uh, and, and, then the, and, then, and the ors for this. Um, and that's called conjunction and disjunction here. And we can, we can kind of see why that is if we look at some of the theory behind hitting algebra. Um, so let me get back, let me get into the theory then behind hitting algebra. So I took a bunch of notes and a lot of stuff in pure script comes from theory. Uh, last time we talked about semi-group and um, that comes from like the, the kind of group theory, I think. Uh, that's the page on Wikipedia. You can go and read more about this. Um, but semi-group is just one part of uh, uh, an entire chain of things. Um, right. It's, it's like the basis of like abstract algebra. It's like a kind of abstract algebra um, where you can kind of define the, the joining operator. It's a binary operator. You can define that to be whatever you want given uh, for each set. And so like another kind of um, theory is order theory. And order, th and, um, order theory is relating elements uh, in a greater, greater than or less than manner. Um, so if we, if we want to start from the very simplest, um, then we just start with the, the notion that one element is, uh, precedes or succeeds some other element. And that's what we talked about last time with the ORD type class. Uh, the prescript ORD type class, uh, lets you do a, a comparison operator and, um, let me bring it up. Um, and then you can do ordering. So you, uh, two, two elements of a set and you can tell whether they are less than, greater than, or equal. Um, and order theory introduces, uh, kind of formalizes this. Uh, like the most basic type of uh, order is uh, a partially ordered, partial order set. And like a lot of theory things, they only become useful, like practical, uh, like useful tools when we can reason about them. And to reason about these things, there are laws. Um, so here we, talk, here we talk about laws again, like the, like the, like the most basic uh, law or axiom or behavior of comparing two elements is uh, uh, anti-symmetry. So in order theory, the, 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 the most basic operation is not just less than, but it's uh, less than or equals. And this allows us to compare uh, two elements in, in like a reverse manner, like A less than equal B. Uh, and then if we want to switch that around, B less than equal to A. And then and like if we formalize it like this, we can uh, um, start having uh, like concepts of like an identity or fix 
uh, fixed points. <laughs> this is just like my, my conception. So like, all, like this is all my uh, understanding of this, but it could be uh, erroneous in several ways. Um, but it's, it's, it's still useful as understanding the notions behind these things. Um, right, so then there's like partial order set and, um, hmm, right. And then if we want to uh, add more behavior, uh, specifications behind uh, explaining concrete types of sets and uh, like or orderings in the set, then we can um, add more laws, more behaviors that we observe. And examples of that is uh, commutative. So if we, um, if we um, do a conjunction of B and A, that's the same as A. And then there's some other ones in the semi-lattice class of orders, uh, which is like associativity. Uh, the partial order set doesn't concern itself with these behaviors, these aspects. But when you start talking about semi-lattice structures, then these people want to start uh, presuming these aspects of semi-lattice. Um, so yeah, commutative, commutativity, associativity, and identity. Uh, yeah. And so, so some people will split the semi-lattice into two separate structures, one being the joint semi-lattice, another being the meat semi-lattice. The joint semi-lattice is, um, uh, let's see, there's, Here's, here's the mathematical operators used for that. So this is the meat operator. It's like the conju, uh, conju, con, yeah, C-O-N-J, conjugation or conjunction, conjunction is the word. And here's the join operator. And this is the disjunction. And I feel like these have similar notions to the uh, product types in pure script and the sum types in pure script, uh, conjunction and disjunctions. Um, yes. So uh, the join semi-lattice and the meet semi-lattice separates these two aspects. So if you have a data structure that you know has a, a join operation, then you can say that this is a join semi-lattice. And then if, and if the data structure only has a meet uh, operation, um, then you can call it a meet semi-lattice. And then the semi-lattice is, well, if it's a join semi-lattice and a meet semi-lattice, then it's a semi-lattice. And uh, yeah, and this is a pretty useful uh, basis on which to start uh, describing algebraic operations on data structures. Um, and then going further from the semi-lattice, uh, people find it useful to add the absorption property onto this where if your data structure can um, be collapsed in, uh, in, in ways like a, um, I, can't remember, I can't remember the uh, conjunction, disjunction, conjunction, disjunction here, but like a and a or b, um, and you can collapse this into just a single a. Um, and uh, so this is about ordering elements in a set but, so the question is like, how does this relate to Hating algebra? Um, and here you can see the operators I'm using are what languages use for logic operators, um, like the and and or. But there is a way that we can, uh, the, the, the and and or operators in logic are roughly equivalent to uh, conjunction and disjunction in um, order theory. So we can, so if we're talking about pure orderings between different sets, like the relationship between them, then we can also say that these uh, are related in a logical sense. Um, and that doesn't really come into uh, play until the Hating algebra. Um, and Hating algebra, can be defined as a lattice, uh, well, a bounded lattice um, that has some additional properties. Um, 
so the, the, the like the one concept that hating algebra adds on top of the bounded lattice is the concept of the implication. Um, An implication is what it's roughly equivalent to um, like the logical implication. So, right, and then hitting out algebra adds this additional concept, and there's several laws, and they're some some of the laws are pretty straightforward, others are not. Um, but then hate and then Boolean algebra is hating algebra, but it adds on the additional restrictions that uh, are required of traditional classical classical logic. Um, and like that, I think, I believe the one additional behavior that Boolean algebra adds on to hating algebra is the behavior like the not operation. Um, like, and I, like the not in, um, operation is kind of like an, um, an inverse. Um, right, so if you're curious about all the specific laws of these things, uh, they should be documented on, uh, in the type classes in Prelude. Um, like I was showing earlier, all, all these laws that are connected to hold. And when I was doing reading on Wikipedia about the nature of these data structures, like lattice and hating algebra, um, I, I, I discovered some additional laws that aren't listed here. Uh, I'm not sure how we decide which laws are become part of this. I'm sure it's quite nuanced and there's reasons behind it. Um, Right, but but yeah, th this is the current set of laws that uh, are expected of pure script. So in the in the prelude, uh, there is no lattice type class right now. There's been discussion of adding it, but it's not currently in the prelude because I believe there's no um, solid use cases for the lattice or semi lattice. So it's just not added. I'm not sure if it um, adds code bloat. Like, so if I want to use hating algebra and this has several parents type classes, um, will like will this make? And I don't care about the parent type classes. Will this add code bloat? Make my code slower? I'm not sure if that's the reason, but um, the current scope of Prelude is um, the set of concepts that are practical. Um, it's like a pragmatic set of these theory concepts. Um, right, so, that, so if in Prelude we were to add the lattice, then some of these operations would be removed from hating algebra and added to these other type classes that are added. So if we add the uh, semi-lattice, then the conjunction and disjunction operations will probably be moved to that type class. And then that would be a parent class of hating algebra. Um, and then similarly, this uh, um, smallest value of the set and the, large, and the largest value of the set, that would probably be part of a bounded type class. Um, and there's, there's discussion of this in the pure script prelude uh, issues. So if you're curious, you can read some. Um, yeah, uh, any, any questions on that? I, th I think this is super interesting, like the relationship between like just ordering and you know logic, <laughs> like logical arguments, like this implies that and um, modus ponens, this, this type of stuff. I think it's pretty interesting. Hmm. Um, I just wanna say something about like why we have um, hating algebra and not lattices actually, if I can. Yeah. Maybe, right? Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> so we did have uh, a lattice hierarchy at one point, but like you said, it's all a bit of um, what's practical, right? And uh, we didn't have enough use cases for lattice to make it really useful. Um, <clears throat> so the ones that, like, the, the way I think about lattice is that, you know, it's about, it's about learning information over time, right? Like you, um, you have some sort of set of facts that you want to learn or something, and you think about the lattice as tracking what I know and the meat and is it join on me? Like, you know, I can move up in the lattice by sort of learning new information, taking the meat or join, whichever way around it is, right? So like move up in the lattice. If I hit the top, that's a contradiction. The bottom is like the I have no information today, right? 
And this can be like really useful in like, uh, you know, when you're doing some parallel programming, you know, parallel, well, parallel or con concurrent programming, right? You have different threads learning different information, you want to combine this information. But ultimately, it was it was tricky to get it right and probably to get the abstractions right and not sort of make it too overbearing for relatively few uh, applications. Um, the reason we have pacing algebra is that, you know, we already had Boolean algebra, okay? and um, we want the type classes to be useful for some sort of like, you know, abstract interpretation where, you know, think about like monoid, right? Monoid is like, like you said before, right? It's the theory where you have an associative um, binary operation, right? That's very, very generally used for many things and you can use it to sort of, um, you know, maybe I have, you know, a language with an addition operator and I want to sort of, uh, you know, abstractly interpret that addition operation or something, right? You can do that with a monoid or something, or any binary operation, right? Like, similarly, I want to sort of, uh, I, want, I want to sort of like interpret my, if I have a language with like Boolean operations, I want to maybe interpret those things abstractly. One example would be something like fuzzy logic, right? Three value logic, which unfortunately doesn't satisfy the laws of Boolean algebra, but it does satisfy Hating algebra. So, you know, we have a Hating algebra because it seemed like it would probably be useful to be able to have some sort of like abstract interpretation for Boolean logic type stuff. Um, and it was relatively easy to add compared to the, the lattice stuff. So, um, so you, now you can sort of, you can talk, you can use Hating algebra. If all you use is Hating algebra, now you can interpret it in a bunch of ways, right? I can use like uh, three value logic or interval logic or all these different, um, you know, um, all these different models for Hayes algebra that I don't have uh, for, for Boolean algebra. That's, go that's a good point. I forgot to mention that. <laughs> uh, that. That's one of the reasons for separating the Boolean into uh, the Hayes was uh, there was some interest in adding three value logic. And the ability to support that. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, I think hating algebra was like added way back in version one of the prelude. <laughs> so uh, it, it, it's got some. Yeah, it's I think we'd, it'd be nice to have lots of, um, lots of stuff in the library at some point, but uh, it was, yeah, it, it was sort of like too much complication, too little payoff to have it in the prelude, I think. Um, if we had a good way of doing stuff in parallel. I, I'm really interested to see like how you put lattices to work to sort of like uh, do uh, sort of like parallel stuff or like web worker type of stuff in an interesting way. That'd be kind of interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, right. So yeah, yeah, that's all the theory behind um, this order, ordering hierarchy. So yeah, there's. Uh, I feel like there's some improvements that could be um, had by clarifying the intent of the show type class, or maybe adding a second type class, like Justin suggested, like one for debugging and one for human readable consumption. That gets pretty hairy though, right? Because you can really only assume English. So once you have to localize text, then it kind of becomes useless. Um, oh yeah, uh, and someone else, someone who actually writes Rust would probably know this, but there's like two traits for doing this printing stuff in Rust, right? There's like a display for the human readable text and then debug for the actual show instance. I'm not quite sure. Hmm. Yeah, that, that seems pretty useful. Yeah, I, I use the show type class to convert numbers into strings. Is there a better way to do that? Because <laughs> like if ever I have a string, I need to display it to the user like on the, in the web page UI. Like here's the, here's the number you've chosen. And you have to convert it to a string. And like the show instance is the only way I know to do that. I feel like there should be a function specialized for that. There's pure script formatters. Oh, good idea. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to add that to the docs for this that class. <laughs> Thanks for mentioning. Mm. 
yeah, so that, that that's all I have on uh, uh, prelude modules today. Um, yeah, should we move on to something else? Uh, Nate, were you going to talk about F? I don't have anything prepared, but I can. Uh, if you guys want me to, I can kind of like, I would be just walking through kind of like some of the code changes. I don't, I don't have a presentation though. No, I think it's fine. All right. Well, I can do that. Um, one second. Let me turn on, turn off notifications and all that kind of stuff. Can you all share, can you all see my screen? Yep. All right. So in case any of you don't know, I, I've been kind of going through a ground up sort of rewrite of AF to take care of a lot of the issues that we've encountered using it. I mean, AF is kind of a bread and butter library at this point. Um, and uh, for, for async stuff. And so let's, I wanted to do kind of a walkthrough of the problems that we have. There's a lot of issues that we've had. And particularly one of them, in case you don't know, part of a big problem stems from the low level, like the FFI representation of it. So if you look at sort of the FFI file for AF, it's this kind of, it's kind of sort of promise-like in that you get, um, you get you you have like two callbacks and you return you know one's the success handler one's the uh, error handler and like you'll run some sort of computation and then you call one of those callbacks and then there's also this thing called like cancellation which is just another AF effect and um, but there's a lot of problems with this representation and one of them one of the core one of the core problems is just that it's it's wildly sack and safe and so it's it's really easy to get into situations where, uh, well, and this, and this representation is pervasive. So regardless of what you do with an AF computation, it always has this sort of callback continuation representation. And uh, what well, doesn't matter if your effect ends up being synchronous, like through lift F, or if you're trying to do other things like with catching or stuff like that, this representation always will eat up stack. And it's really, really easy to get into situations where, you'll, where you'll, you will just blow the stack. And there is a monad rec instance, but um, monad rec at least severely limits like this, the cases where uh, like you can actually be safe using it. So um, one thing we wanted to address was this was this low level representation, and so we wanted to have a representation that could not not only be safer but also be faster. Because, I mean, the callback approach is pretty fast. And um, so we didn't want to, like, lose a bunch of performance. I had originally done, like, a quick rewrite or a quick kind of, like, experiment in pure, in just pure script. Because that was one original goal was, like, it would be great to have this in pure script, which we did not meet. A goal we didn't meet just because we couldn't get the performance. Um, I couldn't get it quite fast enough. I did just about every optimization I could. And... Um, it was still at least 50% slower than the current version. So at least in the, the new version, there's, there's quite a bit more machinery, but it's, it's also uh, faster. So like the fast path of the new version is gonna be quite a bit faster than the fast path of the old version. So what we, one thing we've done is eliminate this, kind of, this representation. This is a simple representation and it's kind of nice to have just because you know, if you're writing some FFI files, then uh, I know some people have done that and they just type it as app. And so we, we don't really want to lose that. And I provided some compatibility stuff to help with that at least so that it's still easy to write like FFI definitions with app if you want to, and they'll actually be safer instead of just typing it as app. So w w one thing we're doing is getting rid of this low level representation. And one problem with this lower level representation too, is just that none of us are able to even reason about like how it works. I, you know, John, John DeGoes wrote this a while back. And um, if you like, even look at like the bind rep the bind function, um, like this one. This is where like all the magic happens, and there's just like there's all this interleaving of callbacks and some state and like state propagation, and 
it's, you know, continuation passing style is just really, really hard to follow and reason about, at least when you're trying to like, especially if you're trying to debug something. And, um, and since none of us were really able to figure out, like walk, step through this, figure out what's happening. Um, we wanted to kind of see if there's, if we could do a more direct sort of interpreter style over app. Um, and you'll see some, so there's a, see a bunch of hacks in here to like run af. We've pulled, we've put in a bunch of special cases for bugs we found and there's like tail rec M. So there, there's a lot of sort of like ad hoc stuff with it too. We also wanted to create kind of a more coherent API with, with better primitives. And right now, pretty much you've got af, which is just like async stuff. And so it's, it's really just kind of like promise and you can kind of fork it but then you can't do anything with it after that. Like once you fork something, it kind of just like, you know, goes off into the ether and you have, it kind of does whatever it does, but you can't really ever get anything back from it unless you like involve things like AVARs and stuff like that. And our, there's a concept of cancellation where like once you fork something, you can maybe try to cancel it. And so cancellation is an incredibly, in the current API is an incredibly weak guarantee. And so there's a lot of, um, it's not it's not a very expressive API like it, there's and so you get into like we like I wrote I know some of you use some libraries like PureScript app uh, future and uh, like PureScript app future kind of like tries to at least add some of that back like you can kind of fork something off and then you can kind of wait on it and get a result and uh, back from it but there's due to a bunch of issues you know, there's cancellation isn't even a thing you can do with it. And so uh, that kind of helps, but uh, it has a lot of issues of its own. And so we wanted to kind of take all these patterns that we've kind of developed and bake them into the library. And um, overall, just make it easier to reason about sorts of like these asynchronous composition of things. And, um, And also address just some bugs. So I know like in AVAR, there's like one problem with AVAR particularly is that you can't cancel AVARs. Like once you're like waiting in a queue, you can't cancel it. And so if you can try to run the canceller and uh, you may actually never cancel it and you think something's not gonna run, but because you can't cancel AVARs and it was pending, a pending AVAR, you know, it, it'll, it'll like wake itself up sometime in the future and you'll get issues. Hold on one, one moment, let me. Um, so I wanted to go over to the PR. Yeah, it's passing. So, and I can actually, I can turn on the video too. <laughs> Going into, let me bring up the, actually, let, let me bring up this. So this is the core, oh, no, that's AVAR. I want F. So, some of the new primitives we have is kind of like the forking model. I wanted to do more of a, uh, like a fiber based or green thread based API. And um, one thing that gives you, it kind of like bakes in, the, if you've ever used like future to try to do things, it kind of bakes in all that behavior into it. And so, uh, and also like in the process of doing all this, we wanted to kind of come up at least with some at least try to come up with some sort of algebraic laws around like how like these asynchronous things work together. And so we're, we're kind of like working on that on like our hierarchy for monad fork and monad kill and uh, monad bracket. So that's a, a bracket is another feature that we've kind of added into it. But so fiber, 
is, um, <laughs> yeah, monad kill. Huh? So fiber is kind of like our threading, our like thread thing. So like whenever you like fork a computation, it returns this fiber f of a, or f a, not f of a, fiber f a. And this just represents a pending computation. And so this is something that's running in the background. But so, and so it's not just now, like previously, whenever you'd fork something, it would just go off into the ether um, and you'd hope that it would complete successfully. Now fibers are actually a thing, like a reference that you can keep a hold of and you know that you're gonna get a, you can get a result back. And so it's, this is something that supports both joining and killing on top of just like, or cancellation, you know, the kill, killing's a pretty severe term, but um, I guess we're still using that. Uh, but you know, you can, you can cancel these threads, these computations and stuff like that. And so once you fork something, you can call a join on it or join fiber. These are the actual, uh, operations. So join fiber will wait for the fiber to complete and then resume in whatever thread you're joining into. So like if it completes successfully, you'll get the result back. And then if it throws an error, then it will just rethrow in the thread that you're executing in. And you can then, you can try, you can put a try around that if you want like an either result. And so this is a way to actually fork things off and then get things back when they're done versus doing all this sort of like extra coordination on top of it, like in user land code. This is all handled by the runtime now. And then um, one thing that's was kind of a was a recent addition is that you cannot this, these things aren't all just forked off is that they're also supervised and so whenever a fiber forks off threads those threads keep are, are tracked by the parent thread and so that if if something is running in the background and the parent thread completes then. Um, it, it will clean up all those extra threads that are running. And, and that's especially like one thing we wanted to guarantee about this release is that um, uh, things can actually, you can actually reason about like resources and resources being cleaned up and actions being run after, after things need, if they're canceled or if, um, you know, if you want to make sure like, like say you have like a web socket or something, you know, you can like run in a loop and then it gets canceled and then you can guarantee that like those things get, those things get cleaned up, that, that connection gets closed and stuff like that. And so supervision is one, one thing around that. So you'll, you can fork off fibers, they get tracked by the parent. If the parent completes or if the parent is killed then it also kills the other fibers. And you can subvert that too. I mean like if you sometimes you need to spawn a thread and you don't want it to have like a parent, you just want it to be on its own. And so there, there are escape patches around that when you really need it. But that, that, this is kind of the safe default is, is supervised fibers. Um, we still have a notion of cancelers, but cancelers aren't exposed as part of like an API. This is like part of whenever you build like an async computation, you know, you still return a canceler in case the runtime needs, decides that it needs to be halted. Um, so when you're like actually implementing primitive actions, you, you'll, still, you'll still have a canceler. And the only thing we changed about cancelers is that it doesn't return a Boolean anymore because, I mean, nobody used it anyway. You, you'll, it'll get an error or an exception and it just has to, uh, and it just runs an action. And whenever you cancel something like this kill, this kill fiber, like if you try to kill a computation, this will actually block until all cleanup actions have been have been run. So by when you kill, and by the time that kill has been returned, you know that everything has been cleaned up. Another part of the, I added some other things that people like. So one thing too is that launch app no longer carries an exception label. And this is something that, um, it was kind of a lie to begin with in, in that, you know, if you forked off a launch F or launch app, it, it would say like, oh, it throws an exception, but you know, there's no, there's no way in F to actually catch that exception. So I don't actually even add that label now. And actually and one of the guarantees that we have is that if a fiber throws an exception, the, the exception can never interrupt another fiber. And so if it throws an exception and nobody's like watching it or listening to the fiber to wait for the completion of it, in which case it would then propagate the exception to whoever's listening. Um, it will throw it in a fresh stack with the set timeout so that it never actually, it can never interrupt like an, an, another computation. And um, so that, that's uh, another like 
uh, an improvement over the API. And so I added some other things too, like run app. So you can add a callback and you don't have to care about, you know, get a, get a unit back here, stuff like that. So there's, there's just the primitives around fork app, suspend app. Oh, so, so suspending is another thing. This, com this, um, we added this because of laws, but it, it can be useful in some cases. And, and app future has this feature and it's kind of like lazily forking a computation. So suspension with, with apps and fibers is kind of like a lazy on demand uh, computer defect. And so you can suspend a thread and you get a reference to that thread, but that thread's not actually running yet. And then when you try to join that thread, it will then run it on demand and then memoize the result. And so you can like fork off a bunch of things that you may, some resources that you may need at some point. And none of them actually get run yet. And then as you need to, you can pull them out and join them and they'll get run and then share. And so this is, that's a, a fairly useful kind of uh, primitive. And, and same with like threads or fibers is that they're, they're memoized as well. And so once you have a reference to a thread, its result is only computed once. A big thing that we added was bracket. And so we wanted to have a lot of guarantees around, or have actual guarantees around um, like cleanup happening. And so bracket, if you don't know, bracket in Haskell is just a way to, uh, to run like the, an acquisition of a resource. So it's some effect to get a resource, like opening a file handler or something. And then you execute some action with that resource. And then after that's done, you have a cleanup that will then like close the file resource or whatever. And um, whatever the resource may be, it could, you know, there's lots of ways to, you know, to describe a resource, but just abstract, an abstract resource. So it's an effect that it requires something, you can do something with it and then clean it up after the fact. And um, so that's kind of what Bracket does. And Bracket, uh, sorry, I was just looking at the chat. I don't have the chat. Up. What if I don't want memoized fibers, like a fiber which returns a random number or a web socket result? Well, in that case, you would just store an app. You would just use the app. You'd execute a new app. So if you're like forking a computation, you don't want that computation to keep running. It's not really forking. If you want to run it new each time, then you would just run the raw effect each time. The, the point of a, like, you have like a reference at that point. When you fork off and get a fiber, then um, you have like an, a reference to a computation like that's actually running pending. And so um, you can't really, it, it, you would just run it. If you wanted to do it again, you would just, just, you wouldn't be forking it into a fiber. You wouldn't keep the fiber reference necessarily. You would just run the effect again. Um, so memoizing fibers is really kind of the only thing that makes sense for them. And so, so if I fork some computation, which takes time, but which don't involve Ajax, what will happen? So if you're, it, since it's cooperative multi-threading, like it, it doesn't, there's no actual threads. It's just, that's why we kind of went with fiber is that um, if you're just running in a synchronous, synchronous loop, then it will, I mean, then it will just keep running. It has a, it yields on asynchronous actions. So like once you run into an async action, um, then, uh, then it will like yield, it, it puts it into a queue and, um, to keep things running in order. And so, uh, yeah, you can just insert a delay if you need to. I think it's, it makes sense that we could actually like expose an operation to do that. That's not just set timeout. That doesn't use the actual scheduler. Um, if you don't, if you don't want to, if you want to yield the actual JS runtime e event loop, then you have to use set timeout. That's really the only way to do it. And I mean, we don't use set timeout in it for anything internally. But if you actually wanted to yield the JS event loop, then um, you would have to use set timeout. But otherwise, you would uh, you could do like just an async action that resolves synchronously, and that will just yield to other fibers. If you fork two, will they run in order? Um, so around forking, the guarantee that we have is that they will start running in the same tick of the event loop. And so once you, if you fork two of them right now, like it'll start evaluating one until it hits an async boundary and then it will yield. 
Um, but we don't actually guarantee that as like an operational thing. Like if you fork one and then fork another, it, uh, I'm kind of playing with the idea of whether we yield on forks and so it will return immediately and start running things. And then once it yields again, it will go back into the fork. But um, we, we don't provide guarantees that they will actually like run right then, right now, but we will guarantee that they run in the same tick of the JS runtime event loop. So bracket for cleanup, uh, anyways, getting back to bracket, that just lets you do cleanup. We provide guarantees around like when you, if you kill something, if you kill a fiber, then like, you know, bracket conditions will be run, the cleanup will be run, and uh, they won't return until those complete. So this, and bracket actually, we've, we've done some other things with the bracket conditions so that when you, the, the, uh, the handler, the cleanup handler can observe whether the thread was killed, like by an outside, you know, supervisor, whether it, whether it failed due to an exception or whether it completed successfully, and you can observe that result. And that's really the core of the API differences. I, oh, I also, um, I rewrote AVAR. So AVAR has uh, low level F bindings now. And it exists as its own as its own library that you can just call from F. And um, I it no longer so one of the problems with AVAR previously was that put was always uh, it was it acted just like a an unbounded queue is the problem. So whenever you put put would never block. You could always just put and keep putting to it, and it would just put things onto the queue. And so I've just rewritten it to have uh, the same semantics as MVAR. And uh, so a put will block until someone takes it. And so this is, I think this is more expected, like for coordination, it's, it's especially expected. And if you really don't care, then you can just fork the put. And that put, I mean, depending on whether it, it may be killed if it's, a, if it's a supervised thread. And um, we also provide, you can cancel like those queue actions as well. So if something's put and waiting, if you try to kill it, you can, it'll actually remove it from the A bar queue. And, so there's nothing in like I think I think we've handled all the edge cases around cancellation. So everything, one and also one thing in the API is that we don't expose any way to build at least typed a typed way to build a uh, a primitive action without returning a canceller. And this, it's well, that's kind of like one problem is that uh, if you have an async action, you need to return a canceller, and so. We don't actually provide an eight. I mean, you can return a non-canceller, like which is something that just like an, an app action that just does nothing. But um, uh, it's it's important to always like pair an async action with a canceller, and so so things just don't keep running in, in the background. I mean, but that's always up to that has to be up to whoever is implementing the uh, the async bindings. So. Implementation-wise, it's still a lot of FFI code. I mean, it's all FFI code. But um, and it's not shorter. It's actually quite a bit longer. But we've added a lot of new features. So, but it all runs in a single, pretty much a single loop. Oh, and also one thing is about like the uh, par like so. It's always stack safe within a thread. That's one thing I really wanted. And um, so as uh, uh, any, in any given thread that's running, any execution for a given thread is that um, it's always stack safe. And um, now I mean like if you fork something and then keep forking and forking and forking and forking in a, in a like, I don't know, a huge tree, you know, you might blow the stack. Um, but uh, any execution, any like linear execution of a given thread is always stack safe. And we've also, I've also applied that to the parallel instances. And so uh, the parallel instances are also stack safe. And so you can have like, you can fork off, you know, I don't know, a million things. And, um, and, I, and I'll talk more about like this, the kind of like guarantees that we provide around the, the parallel instances as well. But as far as like representation wise, it's basically just like, it's, I call them ad hoc free monads. And so, they just kind of like inline the constructors and but it, it but it has like the same like bind like it suspends the bind 
and it just has kind of a, a, you know a constructor for each primitive action and we just run an interpreter over that and so the interpreter is just basically a big loop that uh, just runs these act, runs these act, read each action and um, and in the fast case it's or in the ideal case where everything is right associative and um, you know it it uh, it has zero allocation so that was another thing too like we wanted it to be super, super performant and so the ideal fast case interpreter has zero allocations with it aside from like the spine of the computation and uh, so it's it's a lot of FFI code but so this is like just some of like the cleanup we have like it keeps track of all the things you forked will clean them up for you guarantee that that things are run but you know it's just a big while loop here and uh, we kind of keep track of all the registers like for our like our all of our binds and um, you know, it just runs through each case. See async, sync, catch, bracket. And it keeps just like the stacks of everything and tries to coordinate them. Um, so everything, which, so which stuff was pushed into the FFI? Uh, yeah, I mean, everything, it's still all FFI, like the core low level, like inter, uh, implementation is still all FFI. Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, there's no reason that someone couldn't implement this on another like backend. So I know, so John, I know is, is working on a similar library for Scala and um, which has kind of like similar semantics to it. So there's no reason this can't like apply to another backend. Um, we tried to keep everything at, you know, the semantics of it at least sane so that you can reason about them. And, um, but I, you know, so so the features are they're hopefully well defined enough, and the semantics are well defined enough that you know they can translate to any packet. But I mean, it, it's just you would have to implement it. It's usually when you're dealing like if you wanted it in an actual threading, like a backend that has actual threading, then you have to think about uh, like kind of like how you coordinate that. You probably have to you know you have to make your own thread pool, you do all the scheduling and stuff. So it's not something that can really be done in just pure script. There's still, it, it, in any case, it would involve FFI work. But, so it has like this, this free representation. It's the same with par like the parallel stuff. You know, it kind of, it's just a, uh, kind of like a baked in free applicative. And uh, I think the parallel stuff is probably just as big as the main stuff, but you know, it's actually, it's kind of, it's pretty complicated. Like once you get down to it, like it builds up this this huge, like you have this free tree. It's not necessarily huge. Most, honestly, most parallel computations are fairly small, but um, like you could run everything in parallel over like a big map and, and we wanted that to still be stack safe, even with everything ended up being synchronous. And so it kind of has the stack safe, free applicative representation. And it kind of just walks over this tree and uh, you know, just keeps tracks of like all, all the different cells and like the results and propagates them up the tree. And when you hit an error, it'll like kill other branches of the tree and stuff like that. So how many threads can you create? I mean, there's no, there, I mean, there's no limit to it. The, the threads are lightweight, like just allocating a thread is, is not very many. Um, I think it may, you may end up with, I mean, there's like, it creates the, like the closure for the fiber and then it has a few like objects for bookkeeping and, but otherwise they're, they're, they're very lightweight. And so, I mean, you can, there's nothing in the runtime that um, limits how many threads you can fork concurrently. Um, now, whether or not you'll get into a situation, like I said, if you have like deep forked stacks, like when everything is resolving synchronously in like a stack, then you'll have just like stack issues in general, just because that's part of like, part of the kind of like the runtime limitations of JavaScript. Um, but uh, as far as things running in parallel, they, it's it's lightweight, and uh, I, I don't think there is. Um, I mean, there's no there's no issues with like hitting a hard limit on threads other than memory, but the, like I said, they they don't they do very little allocation. Um, 
but yeah, I've tried to, I've tried to comment it. And uh, so there's at least like an idea of going, what's going on. And also one thing like the red, like you'll see all this underscore one underscore two is just kind of like me trying to stay ahead of the, the, <laughs> the JavaScript optimizer. So like the JIT, it uses, I, I guess what I call like a monolithic class. I, I you know, I did this experiment, um, when like seeing, oh, if there's, there's like a faster representation for uh, like how we do classes and um, everything uses like the same class with the same slots. And so you will always hit like the optimized case of when like looking at fields and stuff. So that is, so that, I mean, they all use just kind of like this generic slot, slot and it's dispatched based on the tag. So that's the only thing about that. Um, but yeah, otherwise, uh, so it, with the parallel stuff, the guarantees that we have is one stack safe. Um, and then spe specifically for the alternative instance. Uh, so alternative with par app is how we do like racing. And so you kind of like set up all your things in parallel. And whichever one completes first, if it completes successfully, then it will kill all the other ones. And so uh, the guarantees that we have with that is like, if they're all synchronous, then it will only evaluate as many of them as it has to, to get a result. So if they're all, if you have like a, a stack of 10 and they're all, they actually all resolve synchronously, the first one resolves, it will then not evaluate the other ones. So uh, it, it will only evaluate and until it gets an answer, and then it won't evaluate any other. So that uh, was one guarantee. I think for that, it would it, you know use this like use some A bar coordination. So I think they get more than they didn't evaluate much or run too many of them. So does use the promise interface no I mean it is mm -hmm. all right so I wrote a compat module let me actually just so let's so here's the here's the compat module which kind of, it kind of packages up the old FFI representation. So if you wrote code that kind of uses that low level representation, this should at least give you um, a fairly trivial way to, to get that back. And so this is, it's just typed with FFN. And so this is actually pretty similar to like a promise API. It's not really a pro the problem with promises is that just providing a direct like findings to it, you, you won't have anything like cancellation and stuff like that. And so um, you won't be able to kind of like buy into those features. Um, but so, so this is just what it looks like. Just take an error call, like a success call, and you can just run all JavaScript arguments. So the, the, I mean, that's like the easy to to either promises or other stuff in the JSON system if you're writing FFI stuff. Um, and you would just you reuse this function, this function here from FFN app. All right, I think I'm cutting in now. Am I still here? Do I still have, do you guys still have me? Yeah, yeah, you're there, just about. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so you would just use this to convert this low level representation into an app. And, um, but as far as like, so one of the things that Phil brought up was releasing it as, I gotta get, here, I gotta get chat back. All right, so one thing that Phil brought up was like releasing it as a JS library. And I think, I mean, that would be possible. I would have to write some more guarantees, like, cause like, Right now, we, we um, I, I wrap every synchronous action and every like async launching thing in a try catch, and so it would catch errors that way. But I think there are probably other cases 
like I kind of rely on pure scripts safety around exceptions. Um, you know, I know you can still get into like, like if you did some unsafe, like from partial and it threw an exception, it might, it might, um, uh, kill some stuff that it wasn't supposed to. Like it might, it might not propagate through the AF mechanism. It might just kind of break it. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't, I didn't really want to provide guarantees around like those sorts of exceptions, like the exceptions we like to not, or we like to pretend don't exist. And so right now it only provides guarantees around um, exceptions within like actual effects and like catching your effects, like exceptions in the effect system. So if I were, if we were to expose it as like a JS library, which we could, I mean, like it's, it's, it's all FFI. So we could probably uh, just uh, bundle it up in a JS library. Um, but I, I'd have to go through and just make sure that it was actually exception safe because you're more likely to get all those exceptions like, you know, type errors and things like that in JavaScript land. So um, right now it kind of lever leverages the PureScript's safety or it kind of depends on the things that PureScript guarantees uh, rather than uh, JS, which is nothing. Um, it would have to be more defensive. But that's kind of like, hopefully that gives you kind of an overview. I mean, for a lot of use cases, um, for a lot of use cases, it'll stay roughly the same, but I know uh, at least for making more kind of like efficient, composable sort of async things, I think these, these new API changes will make a huge difference. And um, like, so all the things that kind of cropped up in different libraries, we've hopefully they're, we've assimilated them back into the core and actually provided decent, decent guarantees around them. Cause like future was a, was a, was a pretty helpful library. And I know some people um, uh, have used it outside of slam data and ha have liked it, but um, you know, it had, it had a lot of holes in it. And so by bringing it into core, we can provide like guarantees around that sort of behavior. So yes, I mean, yeah, the API is definitely a breaking change. I mean, it's, I don't, I don't think it's like, uh, I, I don't think in general it will be a huge, like if, if you did like FFI, a bunch of FFI code and just type it as AF, then I mean, yeah, that's a breaking change and it might not get caught because it's, un you're, it's unsafe. And it's kind of relying on that low level representation. So you'll have to like just go through and, just change over the types to use the compat stuff. Um, uh, otherwise, for like just like the core day-to-day -day usage, just like the bread and butter usage, it's not really much of a breaking change. Uh, you, you know, just like the way of invoking and launching apps, it just has different types. It takes the same kind of callback, the same either callback. Um, uh, it's just, yeah, now, you, now when you fork, you actually get things back. You can actually like do, do more things with them. So I think it's more, more of an extension than it is a huge breaking change. But uh, yeah, so I, I think overall, it, I, I, don't, I don't think the upgrade will be too bad. I mean, it's, it's pervasive. It is breaking, so it is pervasive. But I, I don't think the changes are like, they're, they're not like, going to significantly change the way you use or, or you won't have to like just change huge pieces of code. So uh, at least I don't think. I hope not. The only th the only different the only thing will be Avar. Avar is probably the biggest change. And with the change like the change in semantics, like around pushing or, or put, not push, around put and stuff like that. Um, there are cases where things you know they didn't block before, but now they're going to block. And so I guess it's it's you know it's always a potential that things won't get run when you expect them to. So you have to go through and you'll have to go through and kind of like look at how your AVAR stuff is working and to make sure they, it'll work with the new semantics for it. So I think the new semantics are a definite improvement though. And so the old AVAR was definitely buggy and had issues, but uh, so I think overall it'll be a big improvement and we'll hopefully, uh, hopefully not have any of the, the old issues that we ran across. But that's about it. Any other questions about like big changes or um, even like if you've got any like suggestions of things that you might have wanted to see in like a core app stuff, you know, I don't, I think overall it's, uh, yeah, I think it's, 
you've ordered the million threads demo. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. Uh, hopefully, it won't be too bad. Um, but yeah, so I, I think it'll it'll be overall it'll be a really nice change. Stack, yeah, yeah. On master, it'll definitely. I mean, if this isn't merged yet. Yeah, so on master, it will definitely uh, stack overflow. And I don't know how the threads demo threads demo works. Um, like I said, depending on like if it's forking a thread that forks a thread that forks a thread that forks a thread, you know, and so on, um, in a synchronous manner, then you might hit a stack limit. Um, like I said, the only guarantee we provide around stack safety is for a given thread. Like the thread will execute in a stack safe manner for the context that it's executing in. Uh, but yeah, any other questions? Any other comments? Nope, but thanks, Nate. That's cool. Yeah, it's very cool. Hopefully, we'll get it out soon. Uh, I'm trying. I'm. I really want to get it. I get it out as soon as possible, just because I know there's going to be a lot of stuff to update. But um, I, I want to make sure it's like at least like right. Like there's no glaring holes. I, you know, it might need a few more tests. But I think overall, the tests we have are pretty good. They, they at least like test every aspect of the runtime as far as I can tell. Might need some more stuff around parallel, but um, I think I think it's in pretty good shape. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll get it we'll get it released as soon as possible. All right. I can't figure out where anything is in the Zoom interface. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. There we go. Stop share. Um, yeah, yeah. Who wants to talk next? Um, uh, there's Adam, right? Did you want to show your uh, your script game? Yeah, I can do that. Uh, let me see. How do I share? You should be at the bottom of the screen. Share, share screen. Okay. Um, so yeah, start on this project. I guess on Monday, um, I have worked on this project previously in Elm because uh, I wanted to figure out how to handle like side effects and all the async stuff that goes in with user input and um, like how the game is supposed to go along. Um, so after I did that, I was like, oh, I'll try it out in PureScript. Hadn't really messed around with PureScript uh, before that other than just like doing some simple projects. Um, so I used uh, Pux for the front end because it's similar to how the Elm architecture is. So it kind of was a little bit easier to digest everything that was going on. Um, so yeah, I guess the, I guess I kind of needed some, some help to get started. So I was asking questions in the PureScript channel about how to create a random sequence. Um, so that's here in my helpers. Um, so just generating a random sequence of numbers between one and four, and then I just map those to the different colors. Um, so that's kind of, where I got started, kind of gave me a little bit, a little bit of momentum, um, and then yeah, just use the use the uh, Pux uh, architecture. So have all my events. So this is if you have worked in Elm, this is very similar to what they call message, um, but here it's called event. So I have my different events where I start, uh, animated color, new sequence, um, resetting the game, setting strict mode. Um, and then inside of uh, update, I guess is where all the magic is, but you, um, Pux uses the Smolder library to help with uh, creating uh, HTML markup. Um, and Pux, I guess, also uses uh, React, some, I guess, React under the hood because it uses render to DOM. Um, but yeah, essentially in here, 
uh, I attach my event handlers. So when they click on a red button, uh, it creates the user click with the color red, green, yellow, blue. Um, strip mode, uh, start and reset. So essentially just all my click handlers. And then inside of updates, um, I have my generate play sequence. Uh, this is for like each round. So whenever you get the correct number of button plays correct, um, you'll, you'll go into a new round. So that new round needs to then uh, generate um, that series uh, of button clicks and then add a new button click at the end. And so I used um, delay for that because I, I was trying to figure out how to use set timeout. I couldn't kind of get that working. Um, but delay, the way that it's supposed to work is supposed to delay computation. So not sh too sure about how that's handled you know, in the effects, um, in terms of effects. Um, but that was working and seemed to work for what I was doing. Um, so, yeah, up here, just all my imports, all my different effects, random console DOM, sound, alerts. I uh, had to use, I uh, found a library by this lady named Bull Deal. I hope I'm saying that right, could be saying it wrong. Uh, but she made a game um, like a long time ago, actually, it was like I think a while ago. Um, and she had sound effects. And so I looked in her library and found that she basically um, used FFI to create the sound effect. Um, so I kind of did the same thing. Because I wanted to use the HTML5 audio because it seemed like the sim simplest thing to do. So here's just all my sounds that I have for the game. And I just export uh, a function uh, called play, which plays one of these sounds. That's where the whole like uh, animate color comes from. You give it a color and then a sound so it knows what to light up and then what um, sound to play. Um, and then inside of here, I just import it and then export it. Um, so yeah, and then inside of my main, I just you know used all of the Pux helpers to get it rendering. Um, one thing I haven't learned yet with inputs, I guess uh, with Elm, they use ports to interrupt with JavaScript. Um, so I'm interested to see like how I could do interop uh, with JavaScript with React using inputs. So I'll probably do, probably try to learn, learn that next. Um, but yeah, I got, got a lot of help from the uh, script community on Gitter. I was asking all kinds of questions in the Pucks channel, so I definitely appreciate their help. Um, so, yeah, this wasn't a, a one-man show. It was really everybody else helping me kind of move this along. So I have a Medium blog that I just did the first part of this series for. Um, I don't know how many parts this is going to have, but um, you can kind of follow along there if you want, or you can just kind of look at the code. Uh, my GitHub, uh, so you can just use my name that's on the Zoom. You can find me on GitHub. So, um, yeah, I think a good experience. Um, hadn't used like such a strong type system before. I mean, like, as I said, I used Elm in the past. Um, it doesn't have as many types, so I was like, "What's going on here? There's a type that I don't understand." Um, and so it was a good experience for that reason, just to get that under my belt and um, just get more comfortable with the language. So that's kind of all I have to share. That's cool. Have you got a demo? Yeah, I have a demo. Um, so I have, um, I put it here. So yeah, it essentially looks the same as how I made it before. So. You know, start the game, starts at one, click there, goes to the next round. Uh, some people didn't like that it wasn't random enough. Because <laughs> uh, there were times when I'd get like green, 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 green. I'm like, when are you going to change? But, um, but then I read an article on randomness, and that is actually what randomness is. So I was wrong. <laughs> so if you do that, um, <laughs> Yeah, if you get an error, you go back, you start over, 
if you're on strict and you get an error, you go back to one. Um, and then if you reset, you just get a whole new game um, with a new sequence. So I thought this was, yeah, I thought it was, like I said, a good experience to learn like asynchronous stuff. And um, so I think my other thing is I want, I want to try and uh, create like a multiplayer game with uh, Elixir. I think that would be kind of like a good second project to work on. Um, so that's kind of what my mind is at right now. We got some questions in the chat. I think or no. I guess not. Oh yeah. Strict mode. Yeah, yeah. What's strict mode? Oh yeah. So you have to get. So if you don't have strict mode, then if you missed one, you just replay that round. But if you're in strict mode, if you're like on level seven, it takes you back to one. Um, <laughs> this doesn't like implement everything um, or in all the ways, I guess, like that, that the actual um, Simon game does. Like, for example, you only have like, uh, you have, I don't know how many seconds, I think it's like three seconds per round. Um, or depending on how many moves you have to make, I guess you get so many seconds for those. Uh, but here it's not like there's no seconds, there's no um, time constraint. Uh, you can just go, you know, forward as, and wait as much as you want on it. But so that would be something else to add, like add more features that the actual assignment team has. So, yeah. You so that you implement this in Elm first, yeah? Yeah, I did. How does the uh, Pux compare to Elm? Is it pretty much a one-to-one -one mapping? Uh, yeah, it's relatively close. I think, um, like for example, Elm has, uh, for randomness, they have generators. Um, so I kind of had used that before, so I was familiar with it. Um, so what ends up happening is you have like a, a generator, generates a random sequence um, uh, through, the Elm runtime, and then it creates a command message at the end. Um, and that command message is uh, another action with the uh, number or series or whatever you created passing, that gets passed into it. Um, so I think I just had to figure that out. Um, but yeah, they do handle things a little bit differently as far as side effects, because they have, like I said, this idea of uh, command message that runs through the Elm runtime, which I can't really speak too much on, but um, it's obviously it's working a little bit differently than, um, you know, what you're having to do just when you're using Pugs, you're just using the JavaScript runtime. So, um, but generally, I think the rules, yes, the rules have remained relatively the same. Okay. Cool, thanks. That was really good. All right, you're welcome. I guess I will. You should put that up on Heroku and put a link on the. Uh... <laughs> Let's see, put a link where? I don't know. It sounds sounds like something I want to play with sometimes. Yeah, I got um, I I have a. Link. Like yeah, I have a link. I'll put it in the chat here. Once <laughs> I'm done. It's on GitHub. GitHub Pages, free. Oh, perfect. It yeah. doesn't ever go down. <laughs> you can just click on it and it works. Okay. If that's all, I'm just gonna, I'll stop sharing. Unless we have one more chat question. Yeah, you're right. Mine goes down. All right, I'll stop. Yeah, thanks a lot, Adam. Yep, you're welcome. So Justin, did you want to show anything or, oh. Yeah, sure. Uh, I guess so. Okay, um, hmm. how do I pull up chat? This is hard. Uh, okay. All right, so uh, I put this thing together called uh, ChocoPie. I couldn't come up with any better name. Like uh, it needs to be like circular and whatever. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This this mic icon doesn't work. Uh, I love your naming system. It's amazing. Yes. 
So like I named it after a snack. So it's a uh, choco pie by Orion Company, and uh, it's basically Cycle JS in uh, Pure Script. So um, I think I'll just dig into an example first. So I had this uh, chatbot that interacts with uh, Telegram, and it runs like this uh, extra program to like scrape torrents on a timer. And then I can also tell it like get, and it'll like get my torrents. So like the, the way that like the cycle stuff works is that you're supposed to have this main function that's pure, and it takes in like stuff that you've gotten back from your drivers, and these are called like your sources. And it's a record of stuff, and then you're supposed to produce a record of stuff with like the same keys. And this is like called your sync. And so like here for my main thing, I like uh, combine the timer requests along with like the actual user message requests that I got from the bot into and send it that to my torrent scraper. And then to my bot, I send the torrent scraper results that need to like get printed out. And then the timer says it's not gonna do anything, doesn't get anything. And so you'll see that these types, like say this tour scraper event result, lines up directly into this, uh, it, well, into the event result here, right? So the driver is supposed to is supposed to produce that for like given key, and feed it back in, and then the sync that comes out, the event request maps into the input over here. And the implementation of the drivers is uh, pretty much like just that. So for torrent scraper, I create a uh, I create a, a event thing. Uh, I forgot what this is actually called. I called it bundles, even though that's not the right name. And so you get like back the event and then a pushing function. And then so I subscribe to that and then I push stuff to it and. Uh, this is actually a little bit out of date, this commit hash. Like, I got rid of this stuff. But the idea is the same. So I subscribe to uh, this uh, stream, and then I run the torrent scraper every time that I have a request, and I push uh, the result of the torrent scraper in. And then the same thing for the bot, where I connect to the bot first, and I subscribe to the results that come back, and then send a message for every result, and then I have this messages that I get back from the bot and then send back through. And then the timer just like does a tick and that's the same thing. So now that we've uh, gone over the example, the code itself should actually be way easier to understand. So if I open up the source, you'll see that in my file of 224 lines, there's something like, 145 uh, type lines and then like 65 lines of actual like implementation. And so if you go about all the way down to the bottom first, or actually, sorry, let's look at run chocopy. So run chocopy has like a bunch of type variables, um, but these are all like kind of provided based on the context. So you're gonna have a, uh, Bundle row, which is like the uh, the thing that you push events into, the driver row, so the row of the record of the drivers that you have, the sync row, which like you produce a main, and the source row that goes into the main and that like is produced from your drivers. So you you give it this uh, main function, which has a record of the source rows, and then produces a sync row, and then you give it the driver and it's a unit effect. And so I have this silly method called chocopy it up. And uh, yeah, this run chocopy has like a, well, like for the type class def declaration, it just, it, it just uh, defines that there's the effects for what's gonna happen in the main, and then the source row, sync row, driver row, bundle row, and a fun, Functional dependencies are set up so that uh, once you get in the row, the things that like fall off from it should be like tied down. So if you have like a given source, then like there should be a sync, there should be the syncs like that come right after it, or um, like definitions locked down to what this source is. And the same thing for like the other things. And so, <laughs> um, 
at the very bottom, I have this uh, chocopy row list thing for how to actually constrain the things. And so you'll see that I'm just talking about the same things that I talked about there, just in the actual constraints. So like I have the same like um, fun, fun depths basically and the same parameters. And for each element, I basically go through and make sure that all the keys are the same because this is important. I guess this is like the most important thing. I make sure that this source element, it, I give it a, I give it this name and I make sure that like it matches to whatever the driver comes back with. I make sure that the, uh, the sync is going to be a stream because it has to be a stream or it has to be an event because otherwise like there's no way I could be able to like do this cycle thing and I'll talk about the implementation detail later. But yeah, I do make sure that sync is going to be an event stream and it has this A that comes back as a driver here for now and then C for my bundler thing. The error message is actually quite easy for me, but I'm like super biased, right? It's like, I just see like, oh, there's a, uh, there's a missing constraint or there's like missing in instances. And like, I'm like, oh, that makes sense. But I guess as an actual user, this would be like absolutely horrible. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I have the choke by row list for the tail, right? So the rest of the list gets processed uh, the same. And I have this, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the events are from pure short behaviors. And I probably won't get to use this for work, but I use this for my chatbot. But uh, yeah, so I had this uh, type equals thing. So my driver, I want to make sure that my driver is a function where it takes the events of A and runs these effects and it has the FRP effect in there just so that like, you can do the pushing thing. And then you have B that comes back. So the, uh, the source comes back. And then C is my bundler thing, is my bundle thing. So I want to make sure that the event is going to be event A. So that's like the correct thing that like the drivers come back with. And then the push is the correct thing where um, the, uh, the, how do I say, the, the, the inputs from the sinks, like you need to have the right one and then it, you have to have an effectful function for that. And then it just, it's unit because, uh, that's just like the stuff you're cramming in there. Or uh, did I miss my variables? No, I think this is right. But yeah, like this thing is just like extra documentation. It doesn't actually like do anything in the implementation because there's no uh, methods. But if we go to the actual thing over here in the where do I have the thing? I have to think, oh yeah. Okay, so I'll just go over to constraints real fast. So we had this thing in uh, PureShape 11.6 where you can turn a row type into a row list. And if you wanna make sure that the ordering of the, of the list that you've created and the list that comes back after you've run it through some constraints, if you wanna make sure those are the same, you have to do this uh, list list row thing. So that's why you have like the corresponding instances for a row to list here. And then, yeah, I have like some extra constraints for some operations I need to perform. So make sync proxies, call drivers, replicate mini. And so this maps to that in the cycle like uh, core, the way it works is that you know that your main function has to produce a record of events. So you have this you create these things you call sync proxies and you make them using like the road types, right? So these uh, sync list P, bundle list P, sync row P, they're just row list proxies. And so after you get those, then you can actually call your drivers with them because you ha now have your record of syncs. So you take this thing and you pass it into the call drivers thing and it calls all the drivers, gets the results back and then like builds up the record of the uh, sources to get back to you. And then once you have those, then you can just run your main function with these sources and it's a pure function. So you get syncs back 
uh, as is. And then once you have your syncs, um, you need to then uh, go through the syncs with the real syncs and then the proxies. And then you need to make sure that like uh, you subscribe to the actual syncs that come out of main and push all the events into the corresponding proxies. So it kind of sounds ridiculous, but this is kind of how it works. Um, and Tom's question, I think I already have like a guide to road to list, but I'm not entirely sure what else to write about it. But yeah, the implementation is, uh, mm, I guess like the only thing that makes sense maybe. So like if you want to make sync proxies, then you need to have the effects, you need to have your row list of the, uh, the syncs, and then you need to have like a row for the bundles that you actually want to create. So the bundle li the row list also comes in here. And then the actual term is something like you create the bundle, so the event and the uh, pusher, you make the sync proxy uh, accordingly. So you make the sync proxies for the rest of the list and then you cons them together, if that makes any sense. So I mean like this is using the pure script records thing where like you basically, the, the nil implementation starts from the empty record and then it just keeps on consing up uh, to get the actual full thing. And uh, I think the other implementations are pretty much the same way. When you call your drivers, you need to like make sure that like some things match up. So the call drivers uh, instance, the constraints also look like pretty, uh, pretty bad. But the idea is that like yeah, the rest of the world needs to work, and then you want to make sure that the records that you're working with they have some labels or like they're like subtypes of uh, the things you're working with and whatnot. And then the actual implementation is like. Yeah, I get the rest of the things. And then for the specific source, I want to get source, which is like down here. So the idea is that you get this uh, driver and you're supposed to feed it in the sync proxy that you've gotten like, from upstream um, from this uh, syncs record. And you just like keep on like slicing off fields from the sync record and then passing it downstream so that like they can, uh, they can get at the things that they can get at the uh, sync that they, they need to instantiate driver. And so, yeah, this is the same thing, which is just like building up this list. Uh, the FRP type comes from uh, pure script behaviors because it's like whenever you push to a stream or uh, if whenever you yeah, subscribe to an event stream or you um, push to an event stream, it's going to be a effect. So is that like... Mimicking what Rx, well, not mimicking, but doing the same thing as Rx or something like that then? Because uh, I guess Rx is more, it's got more of the stuff attached, but we can just do the push and pull and then do the rest in pure script, or how do you do that bit? Uh, what do you mean? Well, how did you do like the pushing and pulling of the events, for example? Oh, uh, there's a function like create that creates this thing called, I call a bundle. Um, can I even find it? Oh, here we go. So yeah, the idea is that um, it's an effect and it's got F FRP, the label, and it gives you back the event that like people can actually subscribe to. And then you get this push function where you push in the values and it's effectful for FRP. Okay. And you can just like keep pushing forever. It's like a subject, I guess. I'm not entirely sure if that's technically correct, but yeah, it sounds like it, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, um, what is it? So it's, yeah, the call drivers, um, yeah, I, like I had to annotate some of these just because the uh, type inference or the record sometimes gets like really messed up. And then uh, for type equals, I really wanted to make sure that I was doing that too to the correct type. But I guess half of these, uh, half of these annotations are probably redundant. But yeah, and then replicate many was the thing where I get the syncs, the real syncs back, and then the sync proxies, and I have to push stuff to them. So 
the uh, constraints are fairly long again, but it's just making sure that they're, I'm getting the master record and then like slicing off fields as I need to when I pass them downstream. And then this does the subscriptions where like, uh, yeah, with the sync, it subscribes to it and then pushes to the bundle. And then you, that's, that's how you get this whole thing. But, uh, and it seems like quite wasteful Sure, well, like when you like create these uh, records, and I could be like unsafe, like coercing stuff, but this is a one time setup that you do with like records of size like seven fields, so it kind of does, doesn't matter, I guess. But uh, yeah, that's actually all the, rec the, all the things. So there's really um, how many matches for class in here? One, two, three, four, five five classes of which only four are actually useful for implementation. So actually this class I should probably just uh, remove, but as the author slash user, this class actually helps me the most in uh, telling me like what thing went wrong, if that makes any sense. Cause like otherwise you have to like dig into, it like tries to dig in too far into like the instances and then like, yeah, like this huge blog in the error messages. But yeah, that's the that's about the idea of this library. So uh, do you guys have any questions? Are you gonna abstract it away to create cycle pure script? Pure script. What would you call it? Per per cycle? No, it's it called it chocolate pie. Right. Oh, this is it. This is like yeah. Yeah, this is it. This oh, is this is pure oh, sugar. Sorry. In which Justin becomes famous. No, I would have thought that this is like just purely doing your calls to. Oh, I can't really realize that this was the thing. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I love the name. Thanks. Yeah, I hope uh, Orion doesn't um, sue me. If anything, I'm promoting their products, right? So they should be thankful. <laughs> Definitely, you should be on a deal with them. If anything. <laughs> Don't even you should be getting royalties for, from them right now. Exactly. But yeah, um, actually, so I can just quickly also show off that I did the, the same thing for cycle run, but of course for cycle run, I didn't have to write the implementation because the cycle run implementation like basically works, right? Like I unwrap the, the drivers because they're like dunked functions for F. But other than that, like it's just the same thing, right? And so when we look at the actual definition, it's just uh, the bottom class that I, the last class that I had before where it's just like, yeah, take these rows, you know, source goes into that and then sync ties on these other two. And then with the run record, you do the rotor list, uh, the actual rotor list on like the, uh, well, you get the record and then you do the row list stuff and then like, the rest and so you do the row list and it's like the same thing except like here you only have the constraints and i guess this might be easier to read but yeah um actually uh i guess if even if i wrote a post about this it would be redundant right because um uh can i find the post real fast like um all of this is based off of um off of Liam's post, uh, where do I find it? In this one. So yeah, and in this one, he has like an example, like called a apply record or something. But it's basically just a. It's it's this exact article, basically just applied to uh, different function signatures. Like here, he uses like IO to I. IO to I and O and I to IO and O and whatever. And then the uh, actual cons uh, instances are, uh, yeah, like just I to O, I and O, right? So I just have like slightly more fancy types, but this is like exactly the same thing that I just applied to CycleJS and then to this uh, pure strip cycle library. But yeah, that's about it. Uh, any other questions? Uh, 
Man, that was awesome. Cheers, mate. Are you going to put it into uh, production? In, uh, well, it's already on production. Yeah. It, for my VPS, it's already oh. in production. Goodness. <laughs> my, my production with uh, exactly <laughs> one user. <laughs> The, the, the definition of production ready is very relative. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you look at uh, my Telegram thing, it's like, uh, there's just like so many messages for this bot has been working like crazy. So, yeah. <laughs> this, has been, this has been in uh, production for like, um, what is it, a year and a half now? So, yeah, I'm like a production cycle JS user. I think that's when we start calling it <laughs> Battle Heart. <laughs> yeah, it's battle-tested. Battle-tested. <laughs> At least then you got all the docs when the IRS come find you. That's all right, isn't it? <laughs> but yeah, um, if anyone wants to try this, they can just ping me with questions whenever they want. And uh, I don't know. Like, like I said, like I'm like super biased because I think the error messages are like straightforward, but. If there's like any docs I can write that can make using this better, then let me know. As far as like the architecture um, and like how to use the source and sync stuff, the docs for Cycle.js will apply to ChocoPy too, yeah? So yeah. I just need to know like, oh, I don't know what a source and sync is. I don't know how to do, what, like what's a driver. I don't know how to update values. I don't know how to do comp component interaction. Like and like nest components, then like the cycle JS docs should educate users for how to do Choco Pi app, apps too. Yeah, basically. And then um, nowadays in cycle JS, they have this thing they call Onionify, where I think it's basically just a bunch of uh, lens helpers. So I guess when people get into like nesting stuff, it's like sure, like the awkward thing kind of becomes that you need to make sure that the uh, inputs for the sources are the same, right? Like the actual driver stuff. So, but other than that, like that stuff is like all in um, normal CycleJS docs. So hopefully those docs are also useful. And yeah, um, the reason I was using IO in my bot demo was just because I was like getting really lazy with the uh, uh, effect rows. But like the master version just went back to using the normal effect rows. So like you have like fun things where like drivers takes uh, three different variables for their effect rows because like they're different, right? And it looks kind of bizarre, but well, they're different types. What can you do? Yeah, I guess that's about it for me. Oh, also, um, I forgot to say, uh, there's this conference that's going on. Uh, well, Cloitre is the actual, like, normal conference, the closure Tampere conference. But there, we're having, like, this uh, small FB conf right before. And so we have, like, a bunch of different talks also. But we're also going to talk about this role list stuff there, just because I thought it would be fun to talk about. And then, like, I don't know. It's like Illuminati. A bunch of Haskellers wanted to hear about PureScript stuff. So, yeah. And so, if you're in Tampere uh, for that conference, we'll we'll have to get a beer. Uh, it's September first, though. But yeah, yeah. Thanks for listening to me ramble about. No, thank you. Oh, the, the, isn't there uh yeah, Phil mentioned that there's going to be a new release branch getting created pretty soon. That's pretty exciting. Is that going to be cut in like a week or two? Um, it should be ready soon, hopefully. There's a lot of open pull requests that are going to go in. Um, I need to just sort of assemble it all and test everything and get release candidate out. Um, but yeah, it's going to be really nice. It's going to be a good synchronization uh, instance chains. Uh, feel the little nice pieces. So, yeah, it's going to be good. Nice. Maybe next month we can 
in, 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 uh, introduce the uh, newest additions there. Yeah, and at least like um, my implementation will also get cleaned up because like you don't have to specify the proxy type with the new syntax. Yeah, I haven't still I haven't seen any example code for that yet. Uh, Justice code is gonna get like. Sorry. Uh, I was just gonna say that like you. Basically, what ends up happening is that you do like a record search for like dot star proxy space colon colon space dot star proxy, and then you just replace it with at, and it's like done. Yeah, I was gonna say your code is gonna get like ten times more readable probably after this. <laughs> <laughs> probably. But yeah, it's about 1 a.m. here, so I'm just going to browse the internet before going to sleep. Okay. But yeah, yeah. thanks, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. I'm going to go as well. Yeah. Uh, have a good day, evening. Yeah, thanks all for joining and sharing, sharing your stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so fun seeing your guys' projects. Yeah, it's cool. Good times. Well, maybe, cool. maybe, See you guys later. I'll have one of mine cleaned up. Maybe I can do that too. Do it. <laughs> right. See you later. Yeah, later all. <laughs>